This is the last video in the Ab Initio Hartree Fock and Post Hartree Fock section. And in this lecture, I want to focus on the computation of molecular properties other than the energy. Again, I'm going to uh, steal slides from a good friend. I'm going to take these from Thomas Bali, and so I continue to use his font of uh, chalkboard bold. And I'll remind you, he's at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland, and this was actually his first lecture, and it's about ground state properties. So uh, it's useful to distinguish properties. Uh, bulk properties of the ground state include things like density, viscosity, hardness, dielectric constant, melting point. Hard properties to model when thinking about molecules, although when we talked about doing simulations to some extent, uh, we did examine uh, some of these things, or we, we talked about things that could be used to examine these things. On the molecular properties side, we have quantities like dipole moment, polarizability, NMR chemical shift, vibrational frequencies that you get from infrared spectra, and so on. So I'm going to focus uh, this talk ex almost exclusively on the molecular properties. And molecular properties usually depend explicitly on the electronic distribution. So we're going to talk about uh, quantum chemical calculations. The wave function is important, and the electron density, which derives from the wave function, is important. There's a mapping between these two. One obviously is computed from the other. And so one way to get at a property is to have an operator act on a wave function, and out comes a property. The expectation value of the, uh, of the property is maybe it has an expectation value of A, just a constant. And uh, Thomas, bless his heart, usually gives me a credit for the oracle comment that I used in an earlier lecture, that a wave function is an oracle. You ask it a question, it gives you an answer. So that's the utility of a wave function. And so if I were to write this in an operator way, it would be operator acting on psi equals uh, property P times psi. Now, another way to uh, think of it is that you may be able to derive a property directly from the density. It's not really an operator per se, so you, you shouldn't think about it that way. But just knowledge of the density can, for, for many properties, be sufficient to compute the property. All right? And actually, the, little, the guy uh, scratching his head here is in part because in density functional theory, which Thomas was talking about in this lecture as part of it, uh, one never has a wave function to work with, but one can still get properties and they derive from the density. And the question was, well, how might you go about doing that? And so a general approach for how to think about the, the unification of these two things, whether it be an operator or just using the density, is that many properties that we're interested in are associated with the response of the electronic structure of a molecule to some external perturbation that would otherwise not be there for an isolated molecule in the gas phase. So that perturbation, it, we could indicate lambda as being some perturbing factor. Uh, maybe the perturbation is a change in geometry. Maybe it's an external, I'll get the cursor out of the way there, maybe it's an external electric field. Maybe it's an external magnetic field. Maybe it's a nuclear magnetic field, the magnetic moment of a nucleus. All of the introduction of all of these uh, fields or changes in structure will give rise to a response. There will be a change in energy because of the new interaction or, or change in geometry. That one's kind of fundamentally different. Now, if I think of a Taylor expansion of the energy in the perturbation, the energy with the perturbation present will be equal to the pre-perturbation energy plus the derivative of the energy with respect to the perturbation times the perturbation, all evaluated, by the way, the derivative evaluated at lambda equals zero, plus one-half the second derivative times the perturbation squared plus one over three factorial, third derivative, and so on. That's, that's Taylor expansion for you. And so we can talk about the first order response of the density to the perturbation, or the second order, or the third order. And these all constitute properties. And I'll, I guess it's easiest to illustrate that. We will illustrate in a moment. Lambda often will be directed along some Cartesian direction. That is, it's represented by a vector. It is a field. 
And in that case, when I take the derivative of energy with respect to a vector, I get a vector quantity. If I take it with respect, the second derivative with respect to a vector, I get a matrix quantity, or a tensor, you may sometimes hear that called. Uh, so matrix is a second rank tensor. Tensor is more general, so this is a third rank tensor. But enough of uh, nomenclature, let's just think about what are these properties that are certain kinds of derivatives of the energy. So let me focus on those. Geometry, electric field, magnetic field, nuclear magnetic moment. And there should be a closed parenthesis there, I guess. And I'll just list here what's the nth derivative with respect to. <coughs> so what is the first derivative of the energy with respect to a change in geometry? Well, actually, we've been talking about that for a long time. That's the energy gradient. And so gradients are used. We minimize gradients when we optimize geometries. What about the second derivative of the energy with respect to nuclear motion? That's actually how you get the harmonic vibrational frequencies. They are the second derivatives of the energy evaluated at the uh, equilibrium structure and that's the classic harmonic oscillator uh, expression, right? The spring expression involves the second derivative as the force constant. And if you go to third derivative, you get the anharmonic corrections to vibrational frequencies. It's a cubic uh, contribution. Now, what about the change in energy as I turn on an electric field? That's actually the electric dipole moment. And if I look at the change the second order response, the second derivative, that's the polarizability, and the third derivative is the hyperpolarizability. If I'm using a magnetic field, I get magnetic dipole moments. Those are zero for closed shell molecules, but they can be non-zero for open shell. Magnetic susceptibility is the second derivative. We've already discussed in the context of electron spin resonance that you get hyperfine coupling constants from magnetic moments of nuclei, if you actually go to the second derivative, you get spin-spin couplings between different nuclei. And these were all uh, derivatives with respect to a single perturbation. You can have mixed derivatives. So if you look at the change in energy as you change the geometry and you change the electric field, that's actually how you get the intensities of an infrared band. And if you look at the second derivative of the geometry and the first derivative of the electric field, you get intensities of overtones and combination bands. And uh, you know this would derive from a physical chemistry textbook of spectroscopy if you really wanted to see all the derivation. This is just a table that tells you what's going on. But you can get intensities of Raman transitions, overtones in Raman spectra, circular dichroism, magnetic circular dichroism, and finally nuclear magnetic shielding. So all of these are in principle accessible then by simply computing energies with a field turned on or with a field turned off and in the case of let's say the dipole moment so I would compute the energy with no field and then I turn on a very small electric field and I look at the change in the energy and that energetic change divided by the magnitude of the field because it's field minus zero so the delta, delta E over delta F for electric field, well, as delta becomes smaller and smaller, that defines the first derivative. So that's my computation. I'll just take a really small value and I'll assume that's a good estimate of the first derivative. That's the classic finite difference way to estimate a first derivative. So that, that kind of a calculation is called a finite field calculation. You turn it on, you look at how the energy changes, uh, you approximate the derivative with a small change, and poof, you're all done. Now, actually, I'm going to step back here for a moment. In, in practice, sometimes you don't even need to do the finite field calculation because you can analytically differentiate the energy expression. So remember that the energy expression is expectation value of the Hamiltonian. It's the integral over all space, psi h psi. So if you can take the derivative of an integral, it'll be the integral of the derivative of psi h psi plus psi derivative of h psi plus psi h derivative of psi. And for certain of these perturbations, you can actually write that down analytically. And not only can you write down what's inside the integral analytically, you can solve the integral analytically. 
And so those are very fast computations, and I won't dwell on technical details, but suffice it to say that all of these are accessible, many of them without the need to do finite field calculations. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with the equilibrium geometry uh, perturbation. So a typical molecule has 3n minus 6 internal degrees of freedom, and I'm going to do this Taylor expansion. So we've already mentioned the derivative of the energy with respect to a coordinate is a gradient. Then there is a second derivative, and because there are many coordinates q, so they're indexed by i, I'll have mixed seconds, and I'll have, uh, maybe I'll call it a pure second, where i is equal to j. And these are known as the harmonic force constants. And there's also cubic force constants, and there should be an i, a j, and a k here. That's why it's in quotes, and so on. Let's forget about those. And let's remember that if we're taking the optimized structure, this is zero at equilibrium. There are no gradients. And so this set of second derivatives is, it leads to this matrix. And so I think Thomas's point here is uh, you can either do this in Cartesian coordinates or you can do it in internal coordinates. It's a little more convenient to work in Cartesian coordinates, uh, but you'd really like ultimately to transform to bond stretchings, angle bendings, the internal coordinates, the normal modes of the molecule. So here is the matrix you get for phi equal to 3n minus 6. If you diagonalize this matrix, you will end up on the diagonal, so there is some matrix that multiplies this to diagonalize it, and on the diagonal will be the relevant force constants for all of the normal modes. The normal modes are defined by this diagonalization matrix. It tells you how the Cartesian displacements of all the atoms feed into the actual internal motions in the molecule. And I have glossed over a little bit that, of course, there are actually 3n Cartesian uh, movements, but there's 3n minus 6 normal modes, so you need to project out translations and rotations. I'll let you take a course in spectroscopy if you'd like to know how to do that, vibrational spectroscopy. But bottom line is, you can rapidly determine the vibrational frequencies which are associated with the force constants and the normal modes corresponding to those frequencies. And when you put the atomic masses in, that's where the frequencies fall out. You need those two together with the force constants. And of course, that's what IR and Raman spectra are. They are uh, the frequencies associated with transitions between vibrational energy levels. Intensities, I've already mentioned previously, you'd need mixed derivatives for that, but those are accessible as well. And uh, so a couple of points to make here. Don't compute vibrational spectra unless you are, have minimized the molecule because certainly they don't correspond to physically observable vibrations. They may be useful to look at for non-optimized structures, but it, it's not something you'd get from an IR experiment. Uh, and, of course, when you do the frequency calculation, there should be an N there, uh, you want to make sure you have all positive frequencies as opposed to including an imaginary frequency. Uh, so a transition state structure, because it has one downhill direction, that is a negative curvature, that is a negative force constant, and since frequencies are square roots of force constants, that's an imaginary frequency, and that means you're at a transition state structure. So you can't take an infrared spectrum of a transition state structure, and so that's the point here. You want to be sure you're at a minimum. And then Thomas makes a point that uh, direct comparison, he, he's a little bit strong here, I guess I'd say, that agreement between individual frequencies calculated and measured isn't really meaningful. I'm not sure I, I fully support that statement. But his point is you really should look at the entire spectrum, compare spectra in, in totality. Uh, and big molecules have lots of vibrations, so that's, uh, that's an issue. Um, here's always good advice from Thomas or me. Don't use calculations as a substitute for chemical common sense. And I don't think there's a lot more we need to say about that. It is true that the second derivatives give you harmonic frequencies. So a real IR spectrum uh, has the influence of anharmonic uh, aspects to the potential energy of stretching. There may be Fermi doublets, overtones, and again, I'm going to refer you to a course in spectroscopy if you want to worry about that. 
Okay, so let's just do a quick example here. So this is what Thomas actually does for a living in his research. He likes to take unusual molecules, put them into a very cold matrix, and shine light on them. And so this azide, when you shine some light on it at 12 Kelvin in an argon matrix, you presumably turn this azide into a nitrine, and the nitrine gloms on to this uh, heterocycle, and you make this interesting illid structure. But then you shine a different wavelength of light, and you make something. Who knows what it is, but here's what the UV-Vis spectrum looks like. Not terribly informative UV-Vis spectrum. And if you shine a shorter wavelength of light, you go back to the black spectrum. So it's, you've got some sort of reversible of uh, this to this and back again, but you have no idea what this X species is because there's really not a lot to get a handle on with this blue UV-Vis spectrum. So, hmm, what should we do? Well, take a different spectrum. So in particular, take an infrared spectrum of the matrix. And usually what, what you'll uh, observe in these matrix experiments is you get peaks that go down because they're not there anymore. You're doing a subtraction of the original spectrum from the new spectrum. So peaks of the new species X go up and peaks of the old species, this illid, go down. And a good way to decide what is X is come up with your best guesses for what it is based on being a chemist, compute the vibrational frequencies, and see if they agree. And so here are all the peaks for the new species X, and the hypothesis that they made was, well, huh, maybe this nitrogen, you can think of this almost like a nucleophilic attack, negative charge here attacks this end of this iminium ion, and you make a cyclopropyl structure, a diaza cyclopropane. So you go and you compute the spectrum. This is actually density functional theory, but let's not worry about that for the moment with a 631GD basis set. And here are the predicted harmonic vibrational frequencies. And you know, if you line them up, it's just not bad. It's pretty good pattern matching. So you know, this one is a little bit off. That's probably one of the larger deviations. Uh, this one's actually reasonably off as well, but looking at the totality of the spectrum, this is pretty good evidence that yes, indeed, that's what X is. So what should you do to calculate IR spectrum? Uh, it turns out people have benchmarked all sorts of levels. Here's a reference going back all the way to 96, bunch of molecules. Hartree-Fock theory has a large systematic error because, and it was a question I asked in a prior uh, video, Hartree-Fock theory predicts bonds to be too strong. Right? We know that correlation gives better energies, better wave functions, and we can think of making correlated wave functions by including determinants that take electrons out of bonding orbitals and put them into antibonding orbitals, because that's all that's left. So the influence of those determinants ought to weaken all the bonds, and so you expect Hartree-Fock theory to overbind bonds, and it does. So because those bonds are too strong, you get systematic overestimation of frequencies. And so uh, I'd actually not characterize it typically by a number. I would characterize it by a percentage. Hartree-Fock usually has about a 10% too high frequency. If you look at MP2, so we add electron correlation, that significantly reduces the error in the vibrational frequencies, and you, know, you get better results. Density functional theory we're going to look at soon, so I don't want to dwell on it. It tends to give good results too. And I'm just going to go right by that. The uh, stretching frequencies involving hydrogen are off more than others because of anharmonicity as well, and so that's an issue, and uh, that's why fingerprint regions are more useful than the really high-frequency regions. And I won't say much about that because that's DFT. Okay, so what about the electric field? That's the next one I'd like to look at. So we're going to put a potential energy term in for the electric field, and I can continue to take derivatives. First derivative is the dipole moment, second derivative is the polarizability, third derivatives are the first hyperpolarizabilities. These are really important in nonlinear optical properties, uh, enormous interest in new materials and coming up with things with large hyperpolarizabilities. And they're actually quite hard to measure, so computation, finding a way to compute these is of enormous interest as well. So let's look at dipole moments first. They're usually expressed in Debye. Here's some very small molecules, and here is a, a Hartree-Fock with a pretty small basis set. 
and you see eh, the agreement is not particularly good, and moreover, you predict the wrong uh, sign of the dipole, so it's pointed in the wrong direction with Hartree-Fock theory. This was an early catastrophe of Hartree-Fock theory, even though the error isn't very large in an absolute sense, 0.4 to by, pointing in the wrong direction does seem sort of unfortunate. And so if we then go to MP2, well, the good news is that now carbon monoxide has the right direction, and mm, otherwise, though, there's not a lot of improvement there, and let's not talk about DFT yet. So part of the issue is the basis set. It's just not a very good basis set. So if I go to a much bigger basis set, this is by a chemist named Sadley. That should be a J, actually, not an I. Uh, it's a polarized valence triple zeta basis set that's been optimized for electrical properties. Well, now, Hartree-Fock isn't doing too bad, even though it still has the wrong sign for carbon monoxide. And when we go to MP2, well, now we're really doing quite well. Uh, it's off by 0.2 to buy for carbon monoxide. It's quantitative for water uh, within a tenth of a to buy for hydrogen sulfide and for ammonia and for uh, hydrogen fluoride. So those are really exquisitely accurate. And a big basis set is just a, a big help. And I'm going to stay away from DFT for the moment. Polarizabilities are in atomic units that would be per cubic bore in uh, in uh, the units most chemists would use, it would be per cubic angstrom, that should be a minus three in that uh, exponent there. And I'll just dump a whole bunch of data here. Here's some experimental polarizabilities. Again, you'll find that small basis sets do not do anywhere near as good as large basis sets. And again, adding electron correlation gives considerably improved results, as you'd expect. So MP2, doing pretty well here. So the pole basis set is a big improvement. The first hyperpolarizabilities, and you get them from a, a third rank tensor in the manner shown here, are actually really difficult to measure, which is sort of a good news, bad news thing. Uh, the bad news is you're not sure if you're right or not. Uh, the good news is it's really hard for people to prove that you're wrong. So uh, good calculations, though, should in principle be giving good values, and they can be used for this. So here's another note about DFT, but we're, we're holding off on DFT. Okay, uh, I, I could go on here and talk about the magnetic field and NMR and the like. I'm actually going to uh, assume that we've watched a lot of videos here in section four of the course, and there's been a lot of content. Suffice it to say that the answer that continues to come back is it's better to do a correlated calculation than an uncorrelated calculation. You definitely can get chemical shifts. You can get spin-spin coupling constants. And we're actually going to do some of that in upcoming problem sets. And so I'm going to stop here within lecture point. I'm going to thank Thomas Bali again for having let me borrow his slides. And I'm going to uh, sign off until we get to section five of the course, when we will resume looking at density functional theory.